city of Gainesville, which many of you know I represent the city of Gainesville, 95% of it. And uh, there were a lot of disturbed property owners that uh, were forced to annex in. 535, there were 115 that were annexed in, mainly commercial properties other than three probably residential areas. So the subcommittee came up with a uh, substitute to House Bill 690, and, and it gives the county an opportunity to challenge I shouldn't say challenge, work together with the city officials, not only in the city of Gainesville, Hall County, or any city that we have in Hall County, but all the 500 cities throughout the state. Today, I do have our county manager, Randy Knighton, with us. I have Chairman Richard Meekum here. I have uh, Scott Gibbs, uh, county commissioner. I have Billy Powell. In fact, let me back up on Scott. Scott grew up in the city of Gainesville just like I did. Uh, Billy Powell, uh, council, uh, county commissioner, grew up in the city of Gainesville like I did. And Jeff Stowe, uh, behind me, also is a resident of the city of Gainesville, and also Craig Lutz. So uh, they're here on this bill. They had asked me to uh, deal with the issue, so I'm trying to deal with the issue, and I'll be glad to try to answer any questions. I think it was affected by the uh, member, uh, Representative Fleming, at our subcommittee meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, gentlemen, I'm, I'm assuming you're back here right behind him. Yes. Thank you for being here. And um, I, I know that there was an interest in speaking, and I appreciate that, but I'm sorry we only take um, conversation and, and discussion from the committee members at the full committee. Um, but thank you for being here, and we appreciate you being here to support the bill. All right, so thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we have a few questions. Okay. Chairman Hamilton. You've already, uh, Madam Chairman, you've already uh, answered my question. I was going to say as long as we didn't, no offense to the gentleman, as long as we didn't have to hear their testimony, I was, would make a motion to do pass at the appropriate time. <laughs> Representative Oliver. In the subcommittee, we moved away from binding arbitration. We decided to go to mediation, which I think was the correct. correct. But on, uh, on line 23 and line 25, we are still using the term arbitration panel. <clears throat> and I just can't remember how we resolve that. I think, uh, uh, Representative, I think that was something that council mentioned that's still in that code section. Isn't that right, uh, Jeff? And we are, that does not impose arbitration rules, is what you're telling that me. That is my understanding. And the arbitration panels that exist in that statute, the parties have to pay for them. Am I correct about that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. It sounds like we may have a motion. Or any other, any other questions? I'm sorry. I'll second sure. the motion, but I don't have to listen to Chairman Rogers anymore. <laughs> This is a Monday uh, bill. This is a Monday bill. Yes, it's a Monday through Sunday bill. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I must admit, you are one of my very favorite chairmen. Oh, thank to the, you. Of thank the committee you. that I serve. I appreciate that you're my chairman of higher education. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> chairman, All right. Chairman Powell, don't you have a couple of bills on the floor today? <laughs> <laughs> but nothing that you can meddle with. <laughs> Well, we are feeling good on Monday morning. All right. So we have a motion and, second. and a second at this point. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. All right. The motion carries. Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Is um, Trey Kelly here? There you are, Representative. Next order of business will be Representative Trey Kelly offering House Bill 913. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I come before you today with HB 913, uh, which creates a conflict of interest provision uh, for individuals who may have a uh, ownership uh, interest in a company 
uh, that receives a license from the Department of Community Health, uh, saying that they shall not be able to sit on that board if the uh, companies that they have ownership interest in are also the ones that they're applying for licenses for through the Department of Community Health. Thank you. We have a question, Representative Oliver. This obviously applies to one individual on one board. And there are many boards where there are many people who have business interest in relation to the board's function. Uh, is there a rational reason for picking out one individual and one board and one business? Well, I, I think here, uh, Representative Oliver, this is really just a step towards good government, open government, transparent government, whether it's you know, for any uh, individual. I, I'm not certain it affects just one individual. I haven't really paid attention to that. It's just been a uh, look to see this good government, in my opinion, that this conflict shouldn't exist. Are you saying that you do not know the identity of the individual on this specific board? Is no, I, I haven't made any attempt to isolate any individual, no ma'am. Thank you. Chairman Powell. Since you hadn't, trade, uh, excuse me, Representative, since you haven't uh, uh, identified who the individual is, could you give us a situation in which this has prompted this legislation? Well, it, I think it's more uh, looking in the future than it is looking in the past. It's really just making sure that people who are coming before uh, you know that are trying to get the license from DCH isn't the ones who stand to benefit from having that ownership interest in the um, in the entity that's requesting the the licenses. We do we do provide some uh, limited exceptions for for individuals who do have the you know medical professional background so that we make sure we're not losing that expertise on the board. All right. Representative Kidd. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, in conjunction with what uh, Representative Oliver was saying, uh, isn't it probably a pretty good idea at some point in time to expand this to other boards, uh, other commissions, uh, lobbyists, and so forth who might be serving on other boards? I'd be willing to have a conversation about the other boards as well. Some boards do have you know, provisions in place through sealed bill, bid processes and things like that that help cover it, but I, I, I think you're, you're right there, Representative. Representative Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, as we get into this discussion more, I'm, I'm having a few more questions pop up in my mind. I, I kind of want an example. Uh, for example, if I have a physician locally that sits on the Board of Community mm -hmm. Health locally, what are they going to not be able to do? Their clinic might be an OBGYN. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do business for the state for Medicaid. I mean, I, I want to know how deep you're getting into this. No, the, uh, there, so a, a doctor is one of the licensed medical professionals that we, mm -hmm. uh, that we have made sure still would be allowed to sit there on the board. It's, they would not be affected because their uh, medical professionals are, are exempted through it. Okay. Thank you. Representative, is it Williamson? Williamson okay, yes. I wasn't sure if it was you or Representative Brockway. <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Representative, I apologize for getting here late to the meeting, but uh, I d just want to make sure that I understand the intent of this. The, um, is it not true, though, that these people serving are fully disclosed and on their public disclosures? Don't they have to do one? A public disclosure similar to the ones we have to do as members of the legis legislature? They do. All right. So if, if they're publicly disclosing any potential conflicts of interest that the public is aware of and then they're going through a competitive bid process, then wh what's the conflict of interest? Well, because you don't always have that competitive bid process here for, for the individual licenses when they're coming before it. If it was just a sealed bid process, there would be much more of an opportunity to, to catch the conflicts. But here when you're talking about Department of Community Health and just applying for licenses, it's not always done through a competitive bid process. It's more of an application process, and then, I, then the license is granted. Representative Oliver. You said that a doctor would not be prohibited from being on a board based on, I assume that's the citation on line 16, chapter 11, or 34, under 43. 
Is that the doctor provision you're talking uh, about? Uh, yes, ma'am. So a nurse who owned a staffing position or a pharmacist who owned a staffing position uh, would not have a conflict, but a doctor, is that your testimony? No, ma'am. Uh, that that uh, section right there covers a wide variety of medical professionals there. So does it cover all the medical professions? Are you sure of that? We can ask legislative council if we need to. One follow-up question. Does 451022 make it a misdemeanor or what is the violation there in relation to uh, 451022 of the penalty in relation to this bill? Let me just pull that up, Representative Oliver. The other boards that are sealed bids are partic particularly the transportation board, but every board has a different procurement process. And so that's what is, uh, and some of them are misdemeanors and some of them aren't, and that's why I'm confused. Yeah, about I'm, line 20, about line 18. <coughs> I'm, I'm getting here. It's, it's a Monday for my uh, iPad here, I think, too. Um, is it your intent for it to be a misdemeanor? It's a, it's a, um, the, the penalties are actually in 451028, uh, and it's uh, subject to removal from office or employment, a civil fine not to exceed $10,000, uh, and then restitution. Um, so it's really, it's really just civil penalties that are 451028. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, proper time. All right, we have a motion. I substitute, excuse me. Do we have a second? Second, anyone? Second. All right, we have a second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed, no? no? All right, so what do we have here? One, two, three, four. All right, we're going to do a voice vote. A hand vote, excuse me. If you're in favor, please raise your hand. I do vote, don't I? I do. Okay, all right, so we have one, two, three, four. Those opposed, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. I'm going to vote yes. So thank you very much, um, Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. All right. Next up, we have um, House Bill 991, Representative Flood. And this is a bill that did not go to subcommittee. So we um, would like for you to go into great detail of your bill and sure. certainly ask if, if anyone has anything else to say about it as we proceed forward. So when you're ready, again, uh, it's House Bill 991. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. I bring for your attention this morning House Bill 991. This is a companion bill to House Bill 704, which this committee passed a couple weeks ago and passed the House uh, overwhelmingly last week and has moved on to the Senate. Um, as a part of the creation or the proposed creation of the city of South Fulton, there, uh, w within the boundaries of the city of South Fulton is a Fulton County Industrial District, essentially Fulton Industrial Boulevard, a portion of Fulton Industrial Boulevard, enjoys a special exemption um, that prohibits, it actually does two things, it prohibits the um, that part of the county to be annexed into any city. It also provides uh, an exemption for school taxes for property. What this bill would do is that it would be uh, on the ballot in March, I'm sorry, in May, and be voted on by all the residents of Fulton County to repeal that local constitutional amendment. We no longer allow constitutional amendments, and so this is the only vehicle that we have available to remove those two prohibitions, to remove the 
special uh, property tax exemption, which would, would be uh, reinstated after the city is installed or created and would allow for the movement of the that particular geography into the city. Right now, the um, local constitutional amendment prohibits the annexation of Fulton and of the Fulton Industrial District into any city. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the sponsor? No questions. Do you have anyone who wanted, wants to come speak on the bill? Or? No, ma'am. Okay. It's 8 o'clock on a Monday morning. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moved, moved to pass, and we have a second. Any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. All right, congratulations, Thank Representative you. Flood. Moving on to House Bill 876, Representative Ben Harbin. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, 876 is a simple bill and it was uh, perfected by your subcommittee and uh, it uh, very simply just takes the five constitutional boards uh, to the same per diem rate that the legislature has, just ties them to that. Um, currently they're at $105, that's in statute and uh, that was done years ago and what we're doing is just tying it to ours, just those five constitutional boards. And the reason I picked the five constitutional boards is because I felt like if we open it up right now with the fiscal restraints, it would be harder for us to, to do this. So let's just move this incrementally and get this to where we have them. I, quite frankly, I think public service should be open to everyone, not just the wealthy. And I think if those folks are coming here and spending the time, then they need to be reimbursed properly or get the per diem properly to cover those hotel expenses and parking and all the things that have to be covered because many of these board members aren't compensated any other way. Uh, Representative Alan Powell, Chairman Alan Powell and subcommittee added his bill, which I'm very much in favor of, which says that in order to get this per diem, you have to physically be at that meeting. You can't do it by conference call or Skype or anything else and then receive that because the purpose is to reimburse for expenses. And uh, so very simply, that's all we're doing. Uh, and it is working off of substitute LC287125S. All right, Chairman Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this, this question may be directed more towards Chairman Powell but um, I know we perfected his bill also in subcommittee. <laughs> and is it your intention to continue to push your bill? Not that this bill wouldn't, I'm just curious if, or, or, or did you simply put this on here? And I, I guess I'm asking what the status of your bill was also. My bill has now become a hitchhiker and somebody else can do the work on this bill now. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm in support of both driving, measures. I just, you know, sometimes, uh, well, you've been here long enough to understand. Yes, Thank sir. You. I think I think I'm driving, but he's not sharing with the gas expenses. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions from the committee? Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there a cost? There is, it's very minimal. You're talking about you know, $68 per person, probably no more than 30, 40 people, maybe a few more than that, but it's very minimal. Okay. Thank you. Any other discuss or questions from the committee? All right, I'll entertain a motion. Move to pass. Do pass and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Those opposed, like sign. I mean, excuse me, say no. <laughs> Makes it easier. All right, the bill passes. Congratulations. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. Is Representative Jacobs here? I've not seen him this morning. Okay. Representative Fleming, you have before us House Bill 1000. And I am glad to have you present the bill from up here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Madam Chair, as the subcommittee heard uh, House Bill 1000, um, this is a bill that uh, makes it easier for 
particularly our local governments, to collect on debts that are owed to the uh, their governments through usually uh, traffic tickets, fines, and whatnot, which are not currently being collected. And the model is very similar to something we already do in the state regarding child support recovery uh, issues. In Georgia right now, if you are a, a deadbeat, so to speak, and not paying your child support recovery, we allow you to communicate that information to be communicated to the Department of Revenue. And they can, before you get any tax refund from the state of Georgia, take that money owed out of that amount and send it to the appropriate party. Uh, the state of North Carolina recently experimented by extending that to, um, to fines and whatnot owed to uh, local governments. And what they found is that they collected millions of dollars uh, through this method. The idea being that if you have a duly owed debt to the state, at this point you've gone through a, a local court and uh, been found guilty of something, and you hadn't paid your debt, as all law-abiding citizens presumably do, uh, then um, we probably ought not give back money from the state to you until you clear up your debts. So what this bill does is produces a method, uh, like I said, very similar to what they did in North Carolina, uh, to put this into action. And here's how we do it. The problem the Department of Revenue had initially was that they said, what in the world are we going to do with 159 counties in 500 cities in Georgia sending to us court records and, and, and whatnot. And that was near impossible for them to, uh, to sort through all that. So ACCG and GMA stepped up together to form, as you can see in the bill, something referred to as a clearinghouse. In other words, if the city of Decatur or Walton County had a, a, an unpaid bill, so to speak, they send that to this clearinghouse and they put it in an organized method language to communicate that to the Department of Revenue so they have one source of information rather than so many different ones. Um, so the bill also provides for that. Uh, after that is put in place in an operational, uh, the method that I mentioned to you earlier of making sure that people pay their debts uh, at the local level will be put into place and we would anticipate and hope for the same success that they had in North Carolina uh, under this program. As the chair knows, and uh, as many of you are aware, it's not just a traffic fine that we're talking about in these situations. Uh, what we also have is um, the Spinal Injury Trust Fund, uh, Victim Assistance Funds. They're all kind of add-ons that are going um, unpaid, so to speak, uh, when uh, we have our citizens who duck and hide and, and don't pay the debts that a uh, court of competent jurisdiction has, um, has, um, has levied upon them. So, um, Madam Chair, that is basically what the bill does. I would certainly be happy to answer any questions from members of the panel if there are any. Chairman Thank Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Fleming, is it not true that um, I supported this bill and voted for this bill in the subcommittee, even though I'm greatly concerned that GMA and ACCG actually agreed on this? <laughs> You know, uh, we talked about cats and dogs sleeping together and in the world coming. And, uh, but, yeah, ACCG and GMA did work together on this one. Usually when they get together, um, uh, even though they have divergent interest on many things, it's usually a pretty good outcome. So I agree with the chairman. Representative Oliver. I'm looking at paragraph C, uh, beginning in line 126. I'm, I want to understand, am I correct that the administrative fee is only applied to the uh, offender who is whose fine is being paid through this clearinghouse. clearinghouse. Yes, ma'am. If, if it never gets past the local level because they pay it duly, then you don't ever get to this level of clearinghouse and some money having to be collected to make it all work. If the if the person has to go, if the city of Decatur goes through the clearinghouse, they do not impose that fee on every offender. No, it's that's only. only yes. A, and is there a cap or not a cap of twenty dollars? There is, I believe. On line 32, 132. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So it's it's the cap, even if the actual cost that City of Decatur pays is $50, the fine, the administrative fee is only going to be $20. Well, and what we're going to learn when this gets yeah. going is if it, if, it, if it works as intended, and of course, with many times you set up something new, there may be some tweaking that needs to be done, and they'll have to come back and make that case to us. But right now, there is that cap. Yes, ma'am. Very likely in other states, it's been a private vendor that's done this. I'm sorry. Is it a private vendor in the other states that have done this clearinghouse? I don't I'm not. I'm not sure uh, if it's a private vendor or not. In this case, of course, it would be a, a quasi-governmental entity between ACCG yeah. and GMA. Yeah. I'm for the bill. I just want to understand that it's not imposed on every the fee is not imposed on every offender 
and the fee is capped on the f offender that doesn't pay. That's my understanding, yes, ma'am. Representative Kidd. I thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, when someone makes a partial payment, uh, the fine might be $100 and he pays 15 to 20 Do they hold this $20 or do they send it on? Uh, they break it up $2 for each one? Uh, there, there is a list in the bill giving the uh, priority, uh, and, the, and the first priorities do go back to the fines that were levied. This, this is part of my question. you got a list of like 13, I think it is now. Start off at three or four, and every time a new one passes, it becomes number one, and the rest of them go down. Uh, some of them are on that list by Constitution, and some of them is on that list by General Legislative Act. And the ones that are on there by Constitution should carry precedent over those that are just on there by Legislative Act. But I think the way it's handled right now is just kind of like whichever one was passed last takes precedent and gets that partial payment. Uh, and so those toward the bottom now, even those that were created by Constitution, might get left out entirely. Are you familiar with any of that? Representative Kidd, that's an excellent question, and it really goes to what's going on right now, not even related to this bill. We could not pass this, and still that issue that you've talked about would be there, and I do not know the answer to that. Deborah does, and she's going to tell us if the chairwoman wants her to. Well, I, don't want, I don't want to drag the doctor exactly mm -hmm. in the real effect. Yes, it's kind of looped in with it, but I can talk to her afterwards if you'd rather. She, I'm sure she could inform you uh, if it does. I, I, that situation, like I said, already exists even before this bill. I'm not sure of the answer to that. Thank you. And Madam Chairman, one last thing. Is this, is this the bill that Gary Jackson has been interested in? Yes. <laughs> At the proper time, make a motion do not pass. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chairman Powell. Thank you. Off of the bed, you know, I have expressed some concerns about this legislation uh, in the past, and mine is probably more philosophical. But let me ask you a few questions. You know, on uh, these local fines, uh, that was one of the reasons that we've had so much emphasis put into misdemeanor probation to close yes, these fines at all. So are we saying now that we need to go to the extraordinary measures of starting to tap into people's income tax refunds because probation isn't collecting the fines? I think that has something to do with what's going on. We've always had a certain level of fines failing to be collected in the state. That's been around forever. And even with this, you're still going to have a number that are not collected. Uh, all this does, it says before the state of Georgia gives back to you money that, um, that uh, did you claim you're owed from an income tax refund, we're going to make sure that you don't owe the state or any subsidiaries thereof any money before we pay you. It's almost like clearing up their bill uh, before you get the change back. Let me further ask then, see if we can get a little bit more clarification now. I hear what you're saying, but that's the purpose of misdemeanor probation, is to be sure that the orders of the court are carried through. So if a probationer that is under probation if that person can't pay, what alternatives does the court have? Well, the, 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 the same alternatives which exist now, and this would not change that. I would suggest to you that a person who can't pay is probably not going to have sufficient income to ask for an income tax refund from the state. So we probably have a situation here with people with the ability to pay. In fact, they've paid income tax to the state, and now they're wanting some money back. So we're probably not delving into the range of folks that you're discussing even though that problem still exists, obviously, and it's one that's being grappled with in many areas. This bill and new clearinghouse probably is not going to really affect that that much. We're talking about people with the ability to, to pay and choose not to. So let me be sure I understand. So we're saying that even though they, there is misdemeanor probation for these traffic offenses, that if these people don't pay, this is just another venue to reach out, even though it seems to me to be pretty extraordinary that we're fixing to go start getting into people's uh, income tax refunds when well, they could have been held they could have been held in contempt i'm sure by the court for not paying their fines well it, it, the court can always hold anybody in contempt for a valid reason that, that, that they see fit and, and once again you are addressing a, an issue that we're grappling with through other measures in the legislature 
This particular measure, though, probably won't go much toward the issue you're speaking of because, once again, you have to be someone earning enough income to seek back an income tax refund from the state. So you're making money. You've just made your decisions about what you're going to pay and what you're not going to pay, and you've chose not to pay the fine that's been levied against you for whatever reason. But then again, the private probation, or the, excuse me, the misdemeanor probation could have already. If you got put on probation, you know, not every individual that comes through with a fine or whatnot actually does if they, if they pay it right away, for example. So uh, there may be some instances there, but, but, uh, but I don't believe to a great extent with this particular bill. So let me shift gears and ask this question. My concern has been with this bill in the past that it is sending a message to the public, a public that's already uh, agitated, I think, to the point of less of so, such a low level of trust in government, especially local government, to the point that they think that uh, police officers are there not to not to enforce public safety, but more about being there to raise revenue for the sporting municipalities in a lot of cases. Do we not think that this may help further that uh, distrust in local government? Well, we, we have made a policy decision in this state that if you do break the law and you are fined, that you have to pay that fine or the consequences. We made a policy decision in the state earlier that if you don't pay your child support, which is already in place, you can have your Georgia income tax check garnished, so to speak, to fulfill that obligation. So we've already decided in the state of Georgia that we're going to use this method for people who don't do what they're supposed to do. We're just now extending it to another level of folks not doing what they're supposed to do. But would you not also think that that public policy that was developed on child support payments, that that had a different level than what we're speaking of on this, plus the agitation that so many people, I remember in the debate on, uh, on misdemeanor probation, was it when people talked about offenders that would be fined $140 for jaywalking offense. Well, that fine was probably $50, and with all the ad additional add-ons, which, quite frankly, we're all guilty, and we we're all in the old days of old, <clears throat> we we're all voting on these bills because it looked like a good way of raising revenue. <clears throat> but now, all of a sudden, it's basically sucking the blood out of everything so that a fine is not a true fine. When someone thinks that they're being fined of something that's logical, say, of $50, every time all the add-ons are there, it's doubled or more. Well, th th there's no doubt that we've had that discussion. You are correct many times about the add-on that we have and what should we fund the spinal injury trust fund? Should we fund the victim's assistance fund? You're right. They could be funded out of the general taxpayer's dollars. However, through the fine system, I think the philosophy is that you've, or you've broken the law. You've done something you're not supposed to do. Rather than making the guy who walks across the street that doesn't make the law pay for it, we're going to put that burden upon you, and hopefully it's an incentive to, to, to not violate the law in these situations. But you are correct. We've had that policy debate down here many a times. I will say to your point, though, you mentioned about the importance of child support recovery. We don't get in front of that with this bill. That's still number one, and that still comes first off the top to, to take care of the children who someone made a promise to take care of. They just didn't fulfill it. Excuse me. Thank you. All Thank right. you. Representative Mosby. Uh, just one quick thing. How are, how are disputes handled? So if I have a dispute. Yes. And this, the money has already been taken from my income tax. But. You, you actually, good question, Representative Mosby. You actually can get to it before that. Okay. If in this clearinghouse method you get notice of uh, basically a garnishment that's going to happen, you have an opportunity to go back and say, look, with this, this, and this is wrong, this wasn't considered, mm -hmm. and that's put on hold until you're heard on that matter. Representative Williamson. I waive. Okay. Any other questions by the committee? Move to pass and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Uh, all opposed, no? Aye. All right. Madam Chair, thank you. And you are may, very may I be excused to go finish chairing a committee? You certainly I, may. I thank you so much. Yeah. Representative Mike J, excuse me, Chairman Jacobs, House Bill 981 is our last measure today. Okay, I'm going back there right now. That's what you were there for? Yeah. Okay. Tomorrow. Thank you. Tomorrow.
I'm sorry. That's all right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and happy good morning to the committee. Um, I bring before you today House Bill 981. This bill arises out of a situation, of course, that we have encountered in DeKalb County, um, <laughs> where um, the, our C, the CEO of DeKalb County, Burl Ellis, uh, was uh, indicted. Uh, the governor, pursuant to the statute that allows uh, him to appoint a three-member panel to uh, review that indictment and see whether it impacts uh, the duties of that elected official, uh, then suspended him from office. Um, the governor chose a member of the county commission to replace uh, CEO Ellis, uh, that's now interim CEO Lee May, um, and uh, we don't have a, a local law that speaks to this specific issue, what happens when a member of the governing authority is appointed into another position. And so the uh, attorney general was asked to opine on that uh, subject, and his answer was, well, he, hold, he still hold in the absence of a, of a local law that speaks to this issue, he still holds both positions. So what the bill does is attempts to set out a, uh, because, you know, frankly, theoretically, I don't know whether it actually will happen, but theoretically, this is a situation that could uh, arise again. Uh, we ought to have a, uh, a default rule in the code on this subject matter. So what the bill simply says is that when an elected official is suspended uh, and a member of a governing authority is pulled off, at, you know, pulled out of that position to become uh, interim, uh, you know, the interim whatever, uh, the member of the governing authority then can appoint an interim successor to serve in his or her place on the governing authority until either A, the suspension ends, or B, the term ends, whichever is first. Um, I, I will say that not every member of the DeKalb delegation is on board with this legislation, although a few are. Um, that's not atypical, as you know. Um, but I, I, I will say this. To me, this rule makes the most sense as a default rule because, A, that person serving on, uh, who was on the governing authority clearly has the uh, confidence of the people they represented in that district. And two, that is someone that the governor has some confidence in enough to appoint them into another position. Um, ultimately, that elected official and the governor should not be faced with the Hobson's choice, well, if I pull this person out of this position, um, do they then, you know, if the, the say the, the, the uh, elected official who's indicted is acquitted, do they just no longer serve on the governing authority? That should not be the rule. So this is the default rule we put out here. I do want to note, because, you know, I've been pulled aside on the floor a couple of times by members of the DeKalb delegation. This particular legislation allows for another rule to be adopted by local act. It's right there at the beginning, unless otherwise provided by local law. So we are not preventing the DeKalb delegation from doing anything. They can certainly adopt a different rule by local act, but we ought to have a default rule to cover this situation in the general code, and that's what the bill does. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First question is from Representative Mosby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this is really not a, a DeKalb bill. This is a statewide bill. Correct? Yeah, it, it would apply statewide. All right. Um, and you mentioned the Hobson's choice. Um, we all face that. If the governor had appointed you, would you have to resign from the General Assembly to serve? I actually don't know the answer to that question, but it, I, I don't really think it matters. I, I don't. I, I, I would say that that's probably governed constitutionally, um, and I'll get an answer to that before we end up on the House floor with this bill. Um, but by the same token, um, again, I think this is a this is a logical um, way to handle this particular situation. I, I don't know the direct answer to your question, nor do I want to be appointed to some other position than serving <laughs> the good people of the 80th House District. So. Yeah, I, I just I believe that whenever you decide that you're going to do these things, you you take on the risk of whatever whatever that is uh, when you decide that you want to 
step up and, and take their, their role. I guess um, specifically in DeKalb County, did anybody in the county ask you to bring this bill forward? The CEO supports it, and he that was made clear at the subcommittee meeting on the bill. That wasn't a question. Did mm -hmm. anybody ask you to do it? Ask me to? Ask you to bring this bill no, forward to uh, No, actually, the, answer, the direct answer to that question is absolutely not. I attended a... Uh, 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 a uh, town hall or a uh, community meeting that you were at as well, Mr. Chairman, um, where uh, the uh, I was there for about a half hour because I had to come in late because of another meeting and leave early because of another meeting. This issue came up three times in the half hour I was there. People who live in this county commission district were feeling unrepresented. I said, you know, we, we ought to have a general state statute that addresses that situation. So that's how, actually how it came up. Um, but the CEO, the interim CEO, does endorse this approach. That's, that's a true statement. Representative Kidd. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, to my friend, one, one question. I'm kind of I'm kind of slow at some reading some of this stuff. Maybe because I went to school out of, out of state of Georgia, I don't know. But what we're saying, if the governor appoints me to fill a vacated position, and at some point in time, for whatever reason, I can't continue to serve, that I, in turn, can turn around and appoint him. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? If he lives in your district and you are a member of a city council or county so, commission, so, then the answer to that question is yes. So what, but, re but recognize also, Representative Kidd, the, the indict you know, there, in this particular situation, there are two indictments. And if the first indictment is dismissed, the CEO comes back, and that could have happened two months after. I mean, the, the bottom line is there's really no way to gauge how long the, 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 the suspension is going to last. I mean, if it's two months, then are we saying that, uh, uh, you know, th this member of the governing authority shouldn't be able to, you know, resume his seat on the county commission? I, I mean, I think that's an absurd rule. We ought to, for however long it is, temporary, we should be able to afford those folks some kind of representation. Uh, I know that you said that uh, uh, we've got to trust who the governor put on there, and so if you put a good person on there, then that good person is going to appoint some other good person. That's not always the case. Are we not acquiescing government authority from an elected responsibility duty to give somebody else a seat, so to speak? Well, so, some so to speak. <laughs> Uh, again, I mean, there, there's no, there is no way to gauge how long that suspension is going to last. It could be two months. It could be two years. If it's two months, it makes no sense for that, the, you know, the person who was on the governing authority to not be able to resume that seat. Um, the longer it goes, obviously, it's a different story. But you know, the reality is, again, I don't. I think the governor. In, in choosing this, I believe, the governor in choosing someone to replace a suspended elected official on an interim basis should have a free hand and shouldn't have to worry about stuff like this. Not saying that he was, um, but, uh, but you, you know, the bottom line is, I, I think the county commission or a, or a city council is a, is a logical place to choose someone for an interim position like this. I understand, thank you. Chairman Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I need a clarification. Um, on line 15, when it says such member, you know, this is, this is the person that's already been appointed by the governor, correct? That such member? Right. Such member shall be authorized to appoint a temporary replacement to represent his or her district on the governor authority. Is that th their replacement? Or is that should they leave the appointed position? Which which appointment do they have the ability to appoint? The the is clarify the question okay. for me. A person is appointed by the governor to a position. That person then has the is authorized to appoint a temporary replacement also what are they what does that person have the authority to appoint which position does that person the one that they have moved into that the governor has appointed them to or their old position their old their old position okay so just thank you for clarifying that. so what you're saying is 
anybody that is appointed by the governor has the ability then to turn around and make their own appointment? No, only if they are on a temporary basis, only for so long as the suspension lasts but, or... But as you said, the temporary could be two months or two years. So we're, we're giving this person the, the power and the authority to make that appointment. Uh, on a temporary basis, yes. <clears throat> That's what the bill does. And, and you feel comfortable that that is a, a good thing to do I, with, with no other qualifications? I, I think it, logically, I think it makes sense because the folks in that district have chosen that person to represent that district. Obviously, someone that they have some confidence in, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, it's obviously someone that the governor has a high level of confidence in, enough to appoint them into some other position. But you also have just said that the reason this is all happening is someone has already put someone in a position, and they're now under indictment. So it certainly just because they're or in that position does it mean the previous person well i mean any we we hope that uh, you know it's a rare day that we see an elected official indicted i mean that's i i you know i i i understand what i think what you're you're trying to do and I, on the surface it it makes a lot of sense i'm just i guess i'm trying to understand what if we're circumventing any other elective process or other things by a, uh, I understand giving the authority to the governor, but I'm just, I'm confused well, I mean, on why the, we the next, the, I mean, the question then becomes, Representative Hamilton, well, okay, if it's a two-month suspension, I mean, does it make sense to turn, I mean, the, those folks in that district need some voice on the county commission or city council, as the case may be. Um, you know, does it make sense for a two-month suspension or even a six-month suspension to turn around and hold a special election? I mean, I think the answer to that question is probably not. Um, I, you know, again, I, this I'm seemed not to trying be trying to be combative. I'm no, trying to argue the place. I'm thinking. I, I, I argue because of my profession. Right. So it <laughs> the the I'm trying to think of those. I'm taking my own local politics, if you will. And I see how when they appoint, when an elected official appoints a planning commission director or other things, I see what happens when they do. And so I'm just trying to think through the process is all I'm trying to do. So, right. right. And, and, and at the end of the day, Representative <clears throat> Hamilton, or Chairman Hamilton, the, you know, the, the point of this is for this to be temporary. I mean, the suspension is temporary. This interim appointment is meant to be temporary. And just you to also point out that local law can circumvent this anyway. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. And that's the way it should be. All right. Chairman Powell. If I might just add a little bit to what uh, Chairman Hamilton was talking about. I think what he's getting to is it seems to be somewhat incestuous that someone who has been elected, then they take an appointment, but then they appoint their own successor for a temporary or possibly permanent basis. Because the premise of government is that, that everyone is supposed to be there. And in the case, and this is, and I understand why this has statewide ramifications, this is a, another DeKalb County situation. So the guy who took a, who was elected to a position, and then he took that appointment to move to a vacancy of a suspension, they voluntarily vacated his own position, but for him to appoint his own successor, that successor is supposed to be part of that successor's duty, should be to be a watchdog over the guy that appointed him. And it, something doesn't seem quite right with this. And I would, I would submit to you something for your thoughts on this was, if you want to do this, if you just want a temporary appointment, my first preference would say that if you have vacated your position because of an appointment, then that position is considered to be vacated, period. And you have an election for it, and that procedure is already set by law. Second option would be if you're determined that you want to do this so that the other guy can go back to his position at some point, which his successor may not want him to at that point after he's got a dose of it, would be to let the grand jury appoint a successor 
for that short period of time. It's just a thought that I'd throw out there. Other than that, I'll make a motion we table the bill. <laughs> Representative Oliver. We start our questioning frequently is what is the problem that we're trying to solve? In this case, there are several hundred <coughs> thousand people who are unrepresented in DeKalb County. At every public meeting that I go to, at every delegation meeting I go to, this issue of unrepresented people is being addressed. And is it not true that the local delegation has not come forward with a proposal? That, I mean, that's right. And frankly, if the solution is to table the bill, I think the end result of that quite possibly could be that, you know, 100,000 people, which is, you know, the size of, frankly, bigger than many counties in the state, um, continue to go unrepresented on the county commission. I mean, this is a parliamentary inquiry. Parliament, is it possible if the DeKalb delegation came forward and said we want to call a special election that would cost several hundred thousand dollars to fill this position for an unknown period of time, if that were to happen, could we insert that local delegation bill as a substitute for House Bill 981 if we wanted to? We could, we could certainly consider that. But um, in the meantime, we have several hundred thousand people who are unrepresented and the Attorney General of the State of Georgia has taken the position that that's okay. Well, that that is the law. So the reality is that if the DeKalb delegation wants to fix this problem, you would be open to inserting their solution into this bill as this bill goes forward. There's that, or frankly, I'd just love to see the problem fixed. Yeah. At the proper time, I'm Chairman, I'll move to pass. We actually do have some comments by the Legislative Council okay. regarding that. Oh, no, just explain. <clears throat> we, we can't substitute local bills for general bills or general bills for local bills because the advertisement requirement for local legislation. Right. You're locked in to what the local bill is and you're locked into what the general bill is. You can't, so we can't move back and forth. Isn't, Ms. Lanier, would it be true or not true, or would it be true that the general all-encompassing legal ad that I had published in the paper, I don't know when, in January would cover this possible substitute in the eventuality of the remote possibility that the DeKalb delegation came forward with a solution. But wasn't my bit, my advertisement placed in the paper before this bill was introduced? But it was not for that bill. It was not attached to the, there was no affidavit uh, attached to it. I understand what you're saying now. Yes, thank you. So our parliamentary inquiry is resolved. Representative Mosby. Well, I'll defer. I know he has to leave. So. Chairman Powell. If I understand right, Representative Mayor Margaret Oliver, you already have an ad that's been run but you haven't dropped in your local bill yet? I have an ad that was run for other bills that is in, in, capable of covering this situation. It, it, it's, a very, it's a very broad ad that only speaks to an amendment to the Organizational Act of DeKalb that, County, the whatever DeKalb that County, might be. DeKalb County maneuver then. Right. So then you could still drop your, you've got plenty of time because the crossover day doesn't affect local bills. If the delegation had a position, I would, I'm sure the delegation would move forward. I'm just concerned about several hundred thousand people being unrepresented. We, we, I, mean, we, I also have that same concern, but because this has statewide ramifications, mm -hmm. they can affect folks in my backyard, I've got to go to rules, and I really would like to sit in on the rest of this discussion. I'd like to make a subsequent motion that we lay, uh, that we suspend action on this bill until we can have a full committee back, not lay it on the table, but to just to suspend action until later today or upon the call of the chair so that we can work out something. Madam Chair, I'm looking at the people here. I just want to know if there's a vote to pass this forward or whether, I mean, if, if, the, if Mr. Powell makes a motion to lay it on the table, we'd have a vote on that. Um, I'm just... 
I would like to move the bill forward if their votes are here. If they're not, we'll discuss it further. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm not. <laughs> There's not a way. Madam Chair, I believe I have moved to pass, and Mr. Powell has or has not made a motion. I'll make a secondary motion. I'll make a secondary Same. motion that we lay this bill on the table. Okay. Now, um, you, he comes first. He, my motion was first, but the lay on the table motion precedent, if I'm correct. Am I correct about that, Mr. Correct. Madam Chair? So may we... Um, May we vote before I have these two comments, or do I need to take the comments first? I think there is a second on represent. I mean, Chairman Powell's down here. Um, okay. So at this point, we will have some. Um, we do have a couple more questions. I know you need to go, and I'm sorry. Go ahead and go if you need to. Uh, Representative Mosby. Wait, I don't think it's debatable. I think we have to deal with the motion. But did you have? I did, but I, you know, if, if we're going to do this. Chairman Powell's uh, yeah. motion lay on the table. You got this much concern over something this important to stay at Georgia. Let's get this fleshed out. Not on the Monday morning committee, but get more members here. Okay, so yours was the second of the, second of the motion. Of okay. Motion to lay on the table. All right. Question, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Representative Kidd. I know you have another meeting scheduled, and while I support this motion to table, do we want to make it time specific for your next meeting if these people can try to get together or something? We certainly can. Yes, we can do that. Okay. All right. So we have a motion to table. Correct. The substitute uh, to House Bill 981 and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. So we have um, one, two. We have two and three. Okay, so it is tabled, Representative. And it will come up at the next meeting. Tomorrow morning at 8, I think still is a subcommittee meeting, but our full committee meets tomorrow at 1. All right, meeting adjourned.